Hi, my name's Richard Harvey. I'm an ENT surgeon in Sydney, Australia. My practice is in nose and sinus disorders, which makes me part surgeon and also part immunologist or allergist of the upper airway. Corticosteroids in the body do bring about changes uh, due to their effects that decrease protein synthesis. So when used on the skin, they decrease hair production and keratin production. And this produces thinning of the skin and hair loss. And when you stop the corticosteroid use, the skin returns to normal keratin production, including the thickening of the skin and hair loss. That is the nature of skin. It's not seen in the nose or the lower airway. So when we use corticosteroids in the nose or the lower airway, the lining of the lung or the nose does not undergo atrophy. It's a different type of lining, and there's been many studies to show that long-term use of corticosteroid actually prevents remodeling changes from chronic inflammation in the airway rather than deleterious or adverse events from chronic use. No patient who has allergic rhinitis who is still symptomatic needs to be taking a break or stopping their local corticosteroid treatment to their upper airway. Just like it's not appropriate to stop someone who has asthma from stopping their preventative therapy. If they need it from a clinical perspective, they should still be on it. I think the only reason that patients should be breaking from topical therapy to either the upper or lower airway is if there's a question about efficacy or some local side effect that's being induced. Uh, this is the only rationale. Patients should not be advised to stop preventative therapies for the disease process while it's still active and they need symptom relief. Most nasal sprays, once patients understand the technique of delivering it, are really well tolerated. There's a few things I think patients should be aware of. We should be very careful that patients, when they spray their nose, their medicine actually remains in their nasal cavity for some period of time. Sniffing or snorting the drug back only delivers it to the pharynx, and in some patients they are taste sensitive to the, the, the agents in the spray. So I think making patients understand how to hold the nasal spray in their nose a little bit longer is advantageous. And the other thing that can come about from poor technique is when the spray contacts one area of the nose, particularly the septum, often due to the angulation of the spray bottle and the handedness of the person. And this can create drying and crustiness just in one area on the septum because of repeated um, exposure and spray technique. And I think if if you have a simple discussion with patients about how to avoid these two things, nasal sprays are very low volume, generally don't have much of an odour or taste and are well tolerated.